Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Our executive producer, research assistant, Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And our guest this evening is Maurice Cotterell, the heavenly matchmaker, the secret science of the heart, mind, body, and soul, published by the Celtic Press in 2020. To reach Maurice Cotterell, you can at, I'll better spell Cotterell for you. I think you can spell Maurice. Cotterell is C-O-T-T-E-R-E-L-L, two L's there, okay, dot com. And all links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com and ZaharaOnline.com. Audio archives posted weekly for free on iTunes and on your YouTube channel. Maurice, earlier you said that the leaders of the ancient sun-worshipping civilizations left behind all this knowledge encoded in their treasures. Tell us more about that. How did you discover this stuff? Well, that's a long story, Bob. And I have to go back to when I left Navy College in 1970. Uh, I went to see as a radio officer on board merchant ships. In those days, we used to communicate using shortwave radio. I remember trying to contact London from off the coast of South Africa. It was very difficult because at that time we were going through a sunspot maximum. Now, on shortwave radio, radio waves bounce off the sky and cover long distances. But during sunspot maximum, solar radiation disturbs the upper atmosphere, causing radio signals to fade. So I spent a lot of time monitoring the effects of the sunspot cycle. Around the same time, I became interested in astrology because I noticed that when the ship was sailing from north to south or south to north, the crew were relatively peaceful. But when sailing from east to west or west to east, they became agitated. I was fortunate because a copy of the crew list containing the birth dates of the crew is actually kept in the radio office. So I was able to study behavior of each of the star signs. Eventually, I was able to predict how long it would take for one particular star sign to find fault with another one, and to distinguish the star signs of extroverts from the introverts. This is why I became fascinated with the subject of astrology. I was eager to know more and to understand human behavior. It was, quite simply, it was the best way I could find to make life easier for myself. Then in 1989, while working at Cranfield University, I was able to use a powerful university mainframe computer to calculate the duration of sunspot cycles. One of the magnetic reversals turned out to be 1,366,040 days long, mm. 3,740 years. Coincidentally, I later learned that the Maya of Central America revered the exact same number, which they encoded into one of their treasured artifacts. The sun, what I call the sun shield of Monte Alban. It's a turquoise sun shield with gold around the edge, with loops representing sunspots. And this raised the question of how they could have known the same number without the use of a computer, because the computer I used was, as I say, one of the most powerful in the country at that time. So this intrigued me, and I thought I'd better go down to the ceremonial center of the Maya in Mexico, in Palenque. And I went down to look at the uh, FEMA, uh, excuse me, the Temple of inscriptions where Lord Pekal was buried to, see, to try to figure out how they could have known about this long magnetic cycle of the sun, the 3,740-year cycle. Now, <clears throat> I knew other people had tried to interpret the meaning of the carving, and they had their own ideas on what it meant, but none of the explanations seemed reasonable to me. So in the days and weeks that followed, I considered spending time working on my own explanation for carving. But then it occurred to me there was little point in spending too much time on it because I noticed two of the corners at one end of the coffin lid were missing. It was as though they'd been broken off and thrown away. Now that meant even if I did manage to come up with a more plausible scientific explanation, skeptics could, and probably would, always argue that I had not fully explained the meaning of the lid 100%, because around 5% of it, the corners, were still missing. Now, philosophically, I was aware that what the Maya believed was good becomes bad, and what's bad becomes good. 
Now, that doesn't mean what's bad is good. It means what bad becomes good. In other words, if you think about the, the worst day of your life uh, and you, it makes you feel awful, but then you realize that tonight you're much happier and you're not sad anymore, then the badness turns into goodness. And in the same way, goodness turns into bad, badness. Or another way of looking at it is sunshine always follows rain and rain always follows sunshine. They also believed that what was missing isn't missing. And uh, <clears throat> you are me and I am you. They live in a complementary world of mirrors. And the ancient uh, hieroglyphs explain that the Mayas used magic mirrors to predict the future. Now, using all of this information, I, I then set about trying to find the missing corners, and I found a way of repairing the corners using a mylar transparency of the lid. Firstly, I had to make a copy of the line drawing, uh, an A4 size copy of the design of the lid. Then I took a mirror image of the copy and uh, made another transparency, and then when I put the two transparencies on top of each other, end to end, the missing corners could be seen. They were no longer missing. They were there. I'd reinstated the corners, so I'd fixed the damaged lid. Now I could be beginning my decoding. And this is what nobody had ever else, nobody had ever done this before. They just imagined that the Maya were very clumsy and careless. Mm -hmm. They must have broken the corners off and thrown them away, and nobody knew where they were. But the fact that the corners were missing was very, very important. And as I said earlier, seek and you shall find, ask and the door will be opened. Now, once I put, once I had the two transparencies, I then had to look at every single individual part of the design. And it took me about 10 months to find that there was a code of pictures around the border of the lid and there was an inner lid. So there were two separate parts of the lid. The border code ran along the edge and when you put one transparency against the other, you could come up with 25 different pictures around the border. Mm. Those 25 different pictures correlated with 25 stories that could be found in the inner lid when the decoding process was used. And also, on the floor of the tomb, there was an archaeological artifact which actually gave you a picture of it gave you a representation of what you could expect to find when you've used the decoding process correctly and decoded the picture. So there's three levels of information there. We had the 25 border codes, which was like a list of contents, if you like. Then we had the inner lid, which was the 25 stories themselves. Then on the tomb, we had 25 different artifacts relating to each of them. So we had a three-way fix. It was like a navigational fix. Mm. We couldn't be wrong. It was like the Rosetta Stone of Egypt, which enabled the decoding of Egyptian hieroglyphs, where you had three different or two different languages and the Egyptian hieroglyphs together allowed the decoding, allowed Napoleon's troops and scholars to decode Egyptian hieroglyphs. Now, in the same way, once I had these three different levels of information, I was then able to put one transparency on top of the other, once they were colored in, I had to find the colors first. And the first picture took me 10 months, working 10 hours a day, seven oh, days a week. Boy. That's for one picture. Now, there were over 100 pictures in the amazing little Palenque. What That's why it took me so long to do. Now, the first one took 10 months. The second picture took about six months. The third picture took about six weeks. The fourth picture took about six days. The five picture took about six hours. Mm. And eventually, I got it down to about four hours per picture. And that's because I was getting better and better. They were teaching me what to do as I was each step of the way and what I had to do next, what I had to look for, what I had to, I had to spin the transparencies around on particular centers and so on. And then when I got these hundred stories, I then had to put them in the correct order. Mm. And inside the dust jacket of the new book, as you mentioned already, oh, yes. I put just a handful of these pictures. I've actually got hundreds, but I've only put about 30 or 40 in here, decoded pictures. So once I had all of these different pictures, 
the hundred pictures from the lid of Palenque, I then had to put them on the carpet and get the pictures in the right order to make a story. And once I got the story, I then realized that the same story was contained in another artifact. So some stories were contained in the amazing lid of Palenque. Some stories were contained in the mosaic mask of Palenque, which covered the, 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 the face of Lord Paykal in his tomb. Other stories were covered in the Sunshield of Monte Alban. Other stories were co covered in the uh, murals at Bonham Pack, which are paintings on the wall. The, the stories relate to each other. They show Jesus dying on the cross. They show Jesus bowing to an audience. They show Jesus being applauded by the audience. They show Jesus being born in a stable. They show that Jesus was conceived through an immaculate conception. I'm just looking at the pictures now in front of me as I'm talking to you. They show uh, Jesus with two hemisphere, hemispheres of the brain in his head bowing to the audience. Now, the reason they show this picture is because I had to use transparencies, mylars, one on top of the other. But what the pictures tell us is Lord Paykal didn't. He, he used his brain. He put one picture in the left hemisphere of the brain, then inside his brain... He took a mirror image and put that in the right-hand side of his brain. And then using the left-hand side and his right-hand side of the brain, he overlaid one image on top of the other to produce these images. Now, I have to use transparencies because my brain isn't clever enough. But Jesus, don't forget, was a miracle maker. He could turn water into wine. He could do these things. It wasn't the Mayas that were clever. To think that the Mayas were clever <clears throat> is like imagining that all of the Israelis could walk on water. It's like imagining all of the Israelis could turn water into wine mm -hmm. and heal the sick. They couldn't. Only one Israeli could do that, and that was Jesus. Only one of the Maya could do this. That was Lord Paykal. Only one of the Olmec could do it, <clears throat> and that was uh, personified in the stone face uh, of uh, Lord Paykal and in the Olmec stone face from 500 B.C. So... There can be no doubt that this is irrefutable evidence. You know, we can see Jesus with pictures of sunspots on his head. He's telling us he was his son. We can see Jesus growing up as a boy, playing games. We see him as a youth, in pain, burning with desire. We see him holding the cross with his legs crossed, his arms crossed, carrying two pieces of wood. There's just hundreds and hundreds of different pictures that show Jesus has been here many, many times. And in fact, one of the most curious things that happened with the book, after I finished the book, there's a beautiful picture on the front of the book. It's a stained glass window. And this stained glass window is from Hengrave Hall. It's, a, it's an old uh, church and castle in England, on the east coast of England. And uh, it shows God creating the solar system and the 12 signs of the zodiac with his breath. And God is pictured holding the sun, which is a sphere with a cross on it, and he's blowing his breath, solar wind, onto the earth, and he's got 12 signs of the zodiac around it. So you might say, well, what's so clever about that? Well, Hengrave Hall was built in 1538. So how did the people of, of that day and age understand that, the sun creates 12 different types of personality. You're going to say, well, they couldn't have known in 1536. And it wasn't until I finished the book that I realized that the face of the man who plays God in this window, there's a beautiful window on the cover, is the face of William Tyndale. Now, William Tyndale was a cleric in 1536. In 1535, he translated the Bible from Hebrew into English, and from Greek into English. He started off with the New Testament, which was published in 1536. King Henry regarded this as blasphemy against the Catholic Church. So they burned uh, William Tyndale alive. They killed him on, on a stake, on a fire. Hmm. And as I say, it wasn't until I finished the book I realized that God, it, William Tyndale is portrayed as God, creating the earth and the 12 signs of the zodiac. And it suddenly occurred to me that Jesus came back as William Tyndale. 
there's no question about it. This is another incarnation. And I think it's fascinating because what's happened here is that Jesus came back to promote his own book, the Bible, and he couldn't promote it until he translated it into English. So Jesus came back in 15... Well, he was born in about 1494 or thereabouts, uh, and 30-odd years later he translated it on his own. He, went to, he fled the country. He went to Germany and Holland. He, put, he printed 3,000 copies of the Bible in ink with, using a press in Germany, he exported them on horses and carts to the coast of Holland and Belgium, where he put them on board ship, and they were then taken to England, where they were distributed. And then William Tyndale was killed for heresy, because he'd, uh, King Henry said that the, the, the Pope was in charge, not him. Now, of course, Henry changed his mind within a couple of years, because the Protestant Reformation took hold in Germany with the inspiration of Martin Luther, a cleric. And uh, so what we see here is that all of this knowledge goes back thousands of years. Indeed, thousands. it does. They, they understood about the sun. They understood that the sun spins every 28 days at the equator, 37 days at the North Pole and South Pole. They understood that it showers off particles in the solar wind, protons and electrons, a result of the solar fusion process and the differential rotation of the, of the sun. They understood that those particles travel to the Earth or get tangled up in the Van Allen radiation belt. They understood that when they go up and down the Van Allen radiation belts every one second, the Earth inside those belts, the magnetic fields get squashed and pulled. They understood that when the magnetic field gets squashed and pulled, the personality of the baby changes because magnetic fields change the personality of the fetus through genetics. They understood all of that. We are the ones who don't understand it. So they left the knowledge behind, encoded in their treasures, to help us get to heaven the next time. And they wanted to make sure that nobody would decode this stuff unless they understood the two sides of the story. The science, the super science of the sun, I call it, and the spirituality. Only a person who understands both sides of that equation would be able ever to decode this information. And so this is the information I am bringing you now, because this is the information I've decoded. It's extraordinary. It really is. Uh, the whole thing that really, I really uh, excited my family a great deal when I first read the area of which the reincarnations of Jesus goes back a number of centuries and millenniums, actually. And that th really thrilled me because I had been thinking that for a long time. Was that possible? Is it possible that Lord Jesus Christ actually reincarnated? So I want to thank you for that. That was one of the most important things that I learned. But there are other things that I want to touch on a little later on. We need to take a break right now on 21st Century Radio with our guest Maurice Cotterell. The Heavenly Matchmaker, The Secret Science of the Heart, Mind, Body, and Soul, Celtic Press. I think we're about ready to give away a copy of this book. Yes, we are. MauriceCotterell.com. All links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com and ZaharaOnline.com. Ian Eisler, I'm the author of The Chalice and the Blade, The Real Wealth of Nations, and other books, and president of the Center for Partnership Studies, and I've just done an interview with Dr. Bob Hieronymus for 21st Century Radio, and I've really enjoyed it, so I encourage you to listen. And I also encourage you to go to our website, partnershipway.org. Okay, welcome back. Are you with us, Maurice? Yes, I am. Okay, Maurice, um, one of the things I also wanted to touch on was what you noted that Capricorns are old souls who have reincarnated many times and that it's no surprise that Jesus was a Capricorn. Why? Why aren't you surprised about that? Well, it's very uh, uh, serious, solemn, 
uh, erudite. Uh, he is a, he epitomizes a typical Capricorn. Uh, they're down to earth. They're an earth sign, and uh, I explain in the book how we, we get these earth signs and fire signs and water signs and air signs. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus was born during the, the period of Capricorn, which is the 21st of December to the 21st of January, because he was born on Christmas Day. And he has the personality traits of a Capricorn. Uh, so it was a sensible sign to be, really. I mean, he could have been... Capricorn is a very good sign to be born under, down to earth and steady. They're not erratic like air signs. They're not passionate like fire signs. They're not over-emotional like water signs. So of the earth signs, Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn, I would pick for Capricorn if I had to pick one of them. So... He provi- uh, the Earth provides a good foundation uh, for a character. So, you know, I'm not surprised that Jesus was sent down as a Capricorn. Well, for some reason, in this particular incarnation that I'm having now, my life is surrounded by Capricorns, both uh, yeah. male and females. I mean, seven, eight of them, something like that. I mean, it's not just a couple. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you said mentioned something that I found also to be true. You refer to the Capricorn female as the star of the zodiac. Why? Yes. Could you? Could well, you, uh, tell maybe us I'm more biased. About that. Maybe I'm biased. Well, so am uh, I. But, <laughs> uh, they are. Yeah, I don't want to upset all the other ladies, but they are the star of the zodiac. They they are. They are. For me, the perfect female. They are intelligent, hardworking, honest, uh, capable, uh, sensible. They're very much like a man. They're more like a man than a man. Yeah. If you if you stay over at this Capricorn's house, you'll get a, a good meal in the evening. You'll get a nice warm bed. You'll get a good breakfast in the morning. You'll get a picnic to take home on your journey. You know, it, you can. They they're yeah. organised, sensible. They're hardworking. You know, what can I say? You know. You're telling I the truth to, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I happen to have married one as well, so I feel I feel very fortunate. Yeah. No, I, I'm, it's, I'm so surprised uh, that because I've known a lot of Capricorn males, but they're not quite the same at all. In no, my... no, they can, they can uh, get a bit grumpy because they are the goats, don't forget. Yeah. And they want to get up the mountain as quickly as possible, have a look around, and come down the other side. And uh, you can upset them very easily. I've known Capricorn males. You can make one con- You can be friends with them, if you like, or you think you're a friend of them. And you'll upset them with the most innocuous of comments. And they'll stiffen their arms. They'll stab their fists towards the ground. They'll snort some air out of their nostrils. They'll storm off into the distance. You'll never see them again, ever. They're very... They get very upset very easily if you tread on their hooves. Now, that, that's the bad side. And, you know, in the book, I mainly concentrate on the bad sides of everybody, all 12 signs. Oh, you sure, you, sure did beat, not, you sure did beat me up being a Virgo. That's right. Well, there you go, you see. <laughs> now, <laughs> Virgo is a very good match for Capricorn. But, uh, as I say, it's not helpful for me, having been a scholar of astrology for many, many years, scientifically and practically, I, it's, I know it's not good telling people nice things because the nice things aren't going to help them. You know, you've got to point out the bad things so that they can take a good look at themselves and change or work on those bad things, and therefore they'll be prepared to have better relationships in the future. Mm, that's and, and that's why I've chosen to write the book the way I have. It's not to be unkind or anything. It's, it's just that I feel it's pointless to... Uh, to tell people they're wonderful. There's lots of books out there on astrology that will tell you you're wonderful. And by all means, go out and, if you want to cheer yourself up, buy one. But what I want to do is I want to try and bring you happiness and understanding that will get you to heaven. And I won't do that by being nice to you. Because don't forget we're living in hell, and everything in hell is backwards. If you want to be cruel, you've got to be kind. And if you want to be kind, you've got to be cruel. Hmm. Whoa. Okay. Well, hey, how how can... an 
One of the things I wanted to also mention, because so I have a lot of people that are thinking about taking out-of-body experiences and that kind of thing, and I've, as I've related to them, that can be dangerous at times. What would you say about that, out-of-body experiences? It can be, and uh, Freemasons do this all the time. I yeah. mean, senior Freemasons. There are several levels of Freemasons, and... Uh, you know, the CIA are the enforcement arm of the Freemasons in America. That's true. And MI5 and MI6 are the enforcement arm of the Freemasons in the UK. And it's the same around the world. But, you know, and then there are the worker bees who do jobs, and they supply the Freemasons with funds. And they're another layer of Freemasons. But the really esoteric Freemasons go back thousands of years. They built the pyramids. The word Freemason referred to a mason or a stone builder it was free to travel from town to town, building the cathedrals of, of Europe, and before that, the pyramids in Egypt. So they, the, the, the 33 degree ones, those who are very, very advanced, because they said, of course, there aren't 33 degrees, there are actually nine, but they're like first degree, second degree, third degree, ninth degree, 18th degree, 30th degree, 31, 32, 33. It's nine, because nine is the highest number that you can get to before becoming one with God. Right. So all of this esoteric stuff, it's all coded, and it's not meant to be for the profane. It's only meant for those who wish to become one with God again. That's what Freemason is all about from the very beginning. This is the 33-degree ones, and I'm not talking about the lower-ranking ones who might be in it for the money, they might be in it to, for a job <clears throat> or to gain things. They're not the sort of people I'm talking about. The, the 33 degree ones are over. They do all sorts of n nice, neat little, little tricks. They can leave their body on an out-of-body experience. And what they do is they meditate, years of meditation, which allows the soul to come down from the heart, out of the navel, the belly button, and what they imagine to be is a silver cord, which they call the cable toe. And the silver cord allows them to go out of their body into another dimension where they can have meetings with other souls around the world. Now, if you break the silver cord, uh, the cable toe, then you'll die. And in the Bible, it actually says that if the silver cord ever be loosened or the, the golden bowl, that's the halo, be lost, then the, the, the body will return to dust and the soul will go back to where it came from. Mm -hmm. So... There are ways uh, of these higher energy beings on the planet, but there's not many of them. You know, there could be a handful in the world. The, the normal people who refer to themselves as Freemasons, they really don't know what's going on. They haven't got a clue. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about secrets and handshakes and brotherhoods and stuff like that. But the, the true Freemasons, they, they are spiritual beings who've come back to Earth to do a certain particular job or... It's what uh, the uh, Indians call bodhisattvas. They, they, they have a choice to come back down to earth, and they're like baby Buddhas, if you like, or Buddha-type people. They, they come, they've chosen to reincarnate to help the world in some way. So, uh, yes, we can have out-of-body experiences, but it can be dangerous, as lots of this stuff can be dangerous if it's in the wrong hands. And that's one reason why it's secret. But another reason it's secret is in the Bible, Jesus says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, for they will turn and rend against you. Indeed. Neither cast your pearls before pigs. Mm -hmm. And because if you give this information to the wrong people, they don't understand it, and, and they'll hurt you and kill you. So that's why it's secret. That's why they... It's not a secret for me, because I'm not a Freemason, but it's secret for them... Uh, and what you'll find in a lot of these pictures in Central and South America, even in New Zealand and Australia, you'll find the, orig the, uh, the, the Aborigines, the original indigenous tribes, portray themselves with their tongue extended. And this is a mark of secrecy for all of this old knowledge, because if you pull your t push your tongue out, you can't speak. I mean, try saying this knowledge is secret <laughs> with your tongue out of your mouth. <laughs> you can't. You just mumble. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how they portrayed it. It says you mustn't tell this. Do not give this information to the dogs because it's only for very special people, higher souls, who are just about ready to go to heaven now after being in hell for 3,740 years. 
So all the other souls will live life acquiring possessions, acquiring money, and, and they're not ready yet. They've got to come up and down many, many more lifetimes before their voltage is high enough to escape from the earth. You know, you, you, you might say crowd of people, but you might have 20 people, but every one of those persons will be a different aged soul. One soul might be the same age as the body, 25 years old. One might be 100,000 years old, the soul, in a, in a 25-year-old body. One might be 10 years old. One might be 1,000, 2,000 years old. All the souls are at different levels of progress, and that's why uh, some people come back as a different star sign, like a Capricorn, and maybe Capricorn might come back as a Pisces next time because Pisces is a sign of death. So once you've had all 12 signs of the zodiac, if you are born 12 times and you live for 70 years, that's 800, seven, 12, 84, 840 years or thereabouts, you'll come back as a Pisces, which is the sign of death, the last sign of the zodiac. That's when you can escape and go back to heaven. So... You also note something else very important. Is it true? Oh, we're going to take time for a break, and I'll hold on to this question. When we come back with our guest, Maurice Cotterell, the heavenly matchmaker, the secret science of the heart, mind, body, and soul, Celtic Press. Do you think we want you to buy this book? Yes, we do. We want you to buy a couple of these books. I'll tell you what. If you buy, if you buy any one book, just one of these books, you can have from us. Any book that we have covered on 21st Century Radio, and we've got thousands of different ones that we pass on to people. We never sell anything in regards to this because our feeling is this is knowledge that should be free. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This is Max Dashu of the Suppressed Histories Archives. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. For global women's heritages, icons, and video clips, visit www.suppresshistories.net. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio with our guest, Maurice Cotterell, the heavenly matchmaker, the secret science of the heart, mind, body, and soul, Celtic Press. Of course, I've already mentioned before, if you purchase a copy of this book and you can prove it, then all you got to do is let us know and you can choose any book we've ever had on this program for the past 34, 30 some years. It's a lot of different books out there. Okay. Now, Maurice, um, I'd like to move into, oh, wait, no, I did want to mention one more thing about reincarnation that you note. Um, is it really true that the rules of reincarnation imply that the rich return as the poor and the poor return as the rich. It is absolutely true. In the Bible, Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first. And that really goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where a low-voltage soul, a low-voltage soul is born into a low-voltage body, which might turn out to be a servant who's kicked around and pushed around, scrubs the floors. And that servant then begins to think, why are they doing this to me? I haven't hurt them. Why are they hurting me? And the servant gets empathy and uh, compassion and all of the virtues. And the servant's voltage, therefore, goes up. So when the servant dies, his voltage might go up to 10 volts. So he's come back as a rich man. So the poor servant comes back as a rich man. But when he comes back as a rich man, say 10 volts, he treats the servants badly. He kicks the servants. He pushes them around. So his voltage falls. So his voltage falls to about three volts. So when he comes back, he comes back as a servant again. So what we find is that there is an inverse uh, mechanism of transmigration of souls. What this means is fat people come back as thin people, thin people come back as fat people, men come back as women, women come back as men. Rich people come back as poor, poor come back as rich. Black come back as white, white come back as black. So what we dish out in this life, we get back the next life. And this settles the scores of how we treat each other uh, during different incarnations. So Jesus said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than a rich man to pass through the gates of heaven. 
And, and the only way to get to heaven for a rich man would be to give all his money away before he dies, and that way he'll get to heaven. But, of course, we, we hear of all these so-called billionaires today who are supposed to be philanthropists, and they've got twice as many billions this year than they had last year, even though they're supposed to be a philanthropist. So there's no way these people will get to heaven. There's no way. It's not possible. It's easier to push a camel through the eye of the needle than for them to leave this earth and go to heaven. So they'll come back as a poor person. And uh, they could have used the money wisely to help other people. They chose not to. And this goes for most people. When people acquire money, they don't share it, they keep it to themselves, and they get greedy. And greed is a problem with the world. There are too many greedy people. We're here to love each other. If we love each other, our voltage goes up. When our voltage goes up, we go back to God. God gets bigger. The universe acquires more love. It's as simple as that. It's a very straightforward mechanism. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, on page 42, the last page, of the, you note that the last page of the Bible says, I am Jesus, I am the bright morning star, and the bright morning star, uh, that's in Revelation, I think it's 2022 20, or 2011, I'm not sure. How is, how is Jesus related to Venus? Okay, this is very interesting. On the last page of the Bible in Revelation, it says, I, Jesus, am the son of David, the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Now, what he's saying there is there is actually no bright and morning star. The planet Venus, which is next to the Earth, the closest planet to the... Sorry, closest planet to the... It's not. It's the closest planet to the Earth is correct. It's the second closest planet to the Sun. So moving out from the Sun, we have the Sun, then we have Mercury, then we have Venus, then we have the Earth. Now, when we see Venus from the Earth, it's very bright because the sun's shining on it. Now, it takes Venus 584 days to go around the sun once when we view it from the Earth. So in about 290 days, what's happening is when we look at Venus, it's on the left-hand side of the sun as it's going around the sun. So we only see Venus in the, mor in the morning. Uh, excuse me, that would be in the evening. When... Venus is on the right-hand side of the sun. We would see Venus in the morning. So Venus rises first in the dark, dark night sky. And we can see it because the sun is shining on it. And then the sun appears about an hour after that, because Venus is very close to the sun. The sun appears, and the sky goes very bright, and it, sh it shines out Venus. We can't see it anymore, because Venus can't be seen against the sun sunshine. 290 days later, when Venus is on the left, the only time we see Venus is after the sun has set on the right-hand side of the sun. So the sun sets first, and because Venus is on the left-hand side of the sun, Venus doesn't set until a bit later. So we see the su Venus shining in the bright sunshine again. So Venus has become known, because it's so bright and it's slightly blue, the vibration, because of the... Uh, gases in the air. Because it's uh, sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the evening, and because it's bright, they refer to it as a star, the morning star and the evening star. And uh, because the light is very pure, and Jesus is very pure, and Jesus is light, Jesus is referred to as the purest and brightest source of light in the heavens. So Jesus is referred to the is associated with venus so this is why jesus is known as a bright and morning star and that's what he's saying in uh the bible in revelation well it's not just jesus tutankhamun was always was also known as venus lord Paykal of the maya was known as venus uh buddha was known as venus all of the incarnations of jesus were known as venus so again, this is a common thread throughout all of these incarnations that we come across over and over again. When all of these characters died, they went to heaven and became Venus, shining in love, pure love, a loving blue vibration of light, shining from the planet Venus onto the earth. That is what Jesus is. Wow. That's very, very good. Now, uh, what? why do... Scholars agree that the illuminated manuscripts could only have been made by a miracle. 
Well, if you saw one of the illuminated manuscripts, like the Lindisfarne Gospels or the Book of Kells, or any of the other yeah. books written by monks in the monasteries in the 7th century, you would know that it wasn't humanly possible what they've done. Certainly, without electric lights in, in the year 650 AD, certainly without... Uh, I mean, they wrote them on vellum, which is calfskin, with ink and uh, uh, feathers, quills. If you, if you look at it, you cannot understand how it could have been possible. You're left scratching your head saying this could only have been done by a miracle. And the same thing goes for all of these transformers, these carvings, these paintings, these pieces of jewelry, which transform into different pictures, which tell us the stories of the previous lives of Jesus. So these are living miracles. These are living miracles which have now come to light. And they knew, they were, you know, when Lord Pei Kao encoded this information into his coffin lid in the year 694 AD, he knew no human being would decode it until a color photocopier had been invented. Oh. Because that's how I decoded it. Oh. I could not do it the way he did it with his brain. I had to wait until 1988, until a colour photocopier appeared, and I had access to that colour photocopier, and I could put mylar transparencies into the colour photocopier, and I could print hundreds of these off to put on top of each other, to move around, to find the pictures I needed to decode the stories that they were trying to tell me. What a job. What a job. So they knew it was going to take... From the A.D. 694 until 1988, it was like, you know, you can store, there's several ways of storing information. They stored it in carvings, paintings, jewelry. You could even store, you know, I, I, I thought of it this way, you can store information in time. In other words, imagine a guy with a laser gun in his hand <clears throat> drawing a crop circle on the ground. That's one way of doing it. He could get a crop circle, and it would appear in a fraction of a second. But what he could do, he could shine that laser beam into the sky towards a star millions of light years away or thousands of light years away. Let's say a thousand light, let's say 1,500 light years away. Then he could draw a circle in the sky, a crop circle, and that would go towards a star. It would travel around the star and go to another star, it would travel around another star and go to another star, and eventually it would come back to a field on the Earth and create a crop circle. So that information from that crop circle, from, it, from your laser gun, has traveled through space for 1,500 years until it came back to Earth. Mm. So that information has been stored in time. Extraordinary. And I find that fascinating. Oh, so sure can, it is. It is fascinating. You don't have to just store information in carvings or paintings or jewelry or mosaic masks. You can actually store it in time, which is wonderful. Well, with that, we're out of our time. And uh, well, thank you for joining us, Maurice Cotterell. Hope you join us again in the future in a future book that comes out. It was really fabulous. <laughs>